So welcome everyone to the Really 007 podcast. I'm John Kell and we're here for this special interview with cinema legend John Richardson. John is an Oscar-winning special effects supervisor and designer who has been involved in over 100 movies, including nine James Bond adventures. You can watch all our interviews on our YouTube channel, but you can listen to them and more on iTunes and Spotify and leave a lovely review if possible. We're also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, where you'll find plenty of silly interactions between Bond fans all across the world. And with me today, we have esteemed Really 007 contributor, Chris Goldie, who will be just as excited as I am to speak to John. So good afternoon, Chris. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah. And John needs no introduction from us. He is the man responsible for creating so many elements that we cherish as Bond fans and fans of cinema in general. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. John Richardson. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> it's great to have you with us. So you are a special effects legend, and we'd just love you to just share as a start just about how you got into the world of special effects and the influence that your dad had on, on this. I, I I got into films and, and special effects in particular in the time-honoured way, um, nepotism. Um, my father started working in the film industry in 1921, just over 100 years ago. Consequently, I sort of grew up on visiting film sets and mm-hmm. playing cowboys and Indians on Sherman tanks on oh. Hollywood Common and um, being rowed uh, in a small boat through uh, Captain Hornblower's fleet of ships uh on a huge water tank at denham studios back in the 1950s i remember it well because i got a splinter under my nail and i cried and cried and cried until the nurse bought me an ice cream to shut me up um (laughs) but i i hasten to add i was very small at the time so yeah i i started um working on films because i used to go away on location with my father um, in my early teens. I was fortunate enough to spend three months in Israel when he was making Exodus for Otto Preminger. Uh, And I ended up with three jobs on the film. I I worked for my father, helping do the special effects. I worked in accounts, helping them to sort out the invoices. And I had a very small walking part uh, in the film as a kibbutz guard. So, you know, I I started at quite a young age and then went on and um, went on location with him on movies like Lawrence of Arabia, which for me is still one of the best films ever made. Absolutely. um, It sort of grew from there. I couldn't wait to get out of school and... um, you know, start work properly on films, which I did in 1962 uh, on a film called The Victors, which had a, a huge cast, directed by Carl Foreman. And then um, went off to Malaya on a film with Bill Holden, Susanna York and Capuchin, directed by the wonderful Lewis Gilbert, yeah. who I know oh, my word. three or four films with. Yeah. Um, wow. So yeah, the life uh, life went on from there, really. I mean, just in that that, <laughs> that minute alone, there was so much amazing information. I mean, to to say that you know you and you work with your dad on Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, that is such a special memory that oh, it just must be absolutely incredible. And you grow up with it. You you tend to accept it as as normal. Looking yeah. back on it. Yeah. I realise how privileged I was. Yeah. But as as you do it through the years, I mean, you know, you you work on a Bond film. I suppose the first one you you feel really lucky and pleased to be working on it. Um, yeah. But after you've read the script and then you're then trying to figure out how to make a plane plane fly through a hangar or. Um, blow something up or do whatever's required. It becomes a job very quickly. 
um, yeah. and, you know, there's there's an awful lot of responsibility, worry, you know, budgets to adhere to, people to protect, safety, all the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you're still trying to make it look fabulous on the screen. Yeah. Um, I, I like to think that I was fortunate in, in working through what I regard as the the golden age of movie making, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and even the 90s. We didn't have huge crews. The budgets weren't vast like they are today. You know, if you wanted to use a crane on a set, it was, oh, God, how much is that going to cost? Um, now <laughs> you drive past a film set anywhere, and there's five huge cranes out on the set holding the lights and doing whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I'm I'm probably more proud of than anything is that when we did it, we we did it in camera. We didn't Mm -hmm. have CGI to paint wires out. Um, We didn't have all the advantages that CGI can give you. Sadly, I think today it's so overused. It's mm. making movies look a lot more like a cartoon than a mm-hmm. a real film. So I think films, for me anyway, have, have lost reality. And and I really struggle to look at some of the, the comic character films that are mm-hmm. made now because they they do look more like animation than than a real movie Um, absolutely you know everything we did we had to figure out how we could do it in camera either with a model um, or for real if we used things on wires we had to use really fine wires yeah to be able to paint them out and light them out so you know people i don't think realize back in those days that we used to paint the wires all different mm. <laughs> all the way up and down and work very closely with the cameraman mm. to get him to put flags on the lights to take the light off a can off yeah. a wire or put wow. light on it. it it was a completely different world mm. and you know even going back to the the first superman movie i did with richard donner the the best one <laughs> We were flying Superman on very thin piano wires and having to paint them out because we didn't have CGI to, to paint them out afterwards. later uh, on on cliffhanger the visual effects people asked us to paint the wires with bright red paint yeah they could find them easily to paint them out uh, 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 digitally take them out mm-hmm. what happened on on cliffhanger because it was one of the early days of cgi <laughs> was we painted them all red and then they had trouble getting them out <laughs> you know the, the, the joys of movie making. You can do it, sir. Hold her, Gabe. Hold her, Gabe. Please don't let me fall. Please, please, I don't want to die. You're not gonna die. Don't fuck me. Sarah, I got you. Just reach up. You can do it. Please, baby, just reach up. Reach up. Help! 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 Gabe. Man, don't you lose her! Don't you let her go! Don't let me fall! I'm living! 
Sir, please. No, no, it's not a game. Game, don't let me fall. No, no, I'm falling. Game. No. Like you say, those the the, the 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 limitations of filmmaking. You know that that you can't always get what you want, so you have to come up with a creative solution. You know whether it's a crane, whether it's you know like CGI, and whether it's you know like approaching things in a practical sense rather than kind of oh well we can just sort that out in post production. I think yeah. I think for, for for me you see that in a lot of filmmaking now yeah. where there is that we'll just sort it sort it in post and it and like you say there's there's it feels less sort of like grounded in reality because it's constantly painting you paint basically you're painting over the cracks later on yeah. or adding stuff but like i say to, 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 to me what's so exciting and what's so amazing when i look back at the, the, the particularly the films that you've worked on is even it just as a without even thinking about the practicalities of making something they, they are awe inspiring absolutely yes. amazing scenes and then when you actually think about how did people actually create that is even oh. more mind-blowing like i say i think that's the mag for me that's the magic of cinema is that you, you you're not aware of it but when you yeah. actually think about it these are you know uh, the, the, the the greatest technicians the greatest artists who, who are working in it and i think that yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that period where you worked is, is for me, is definitely a, a golden age of, of filmmaking where there was also a lot of variety. Yeah, I mean, there, there were a couple of films, a couple of the Bond films that, you know, I'm most proud of. One um, was Octopussy. The other one was The Living Daylights. Oh. We did foreground miniatures where we would put miniature sets in front of the real set and use the reality of the background mm -hmm. in conjunction with the model. Take over. This time, hold it steady. Where are you going? Drop a bomb. never see the, the joins they never realize that when the plane flies into the hangar on octopussy it was a model plane flying behind a model door but it was in front of a real hangar mm -hmm. with real actors and stuntmen and people um and um you know the the, the <sighs> plane going through the hangar i think it's one of like one of the it's certainly one of the greatest Bond pre-title sequences, isn't it? And that stunt is just yeah. like I mean, the the effects. To hear the stories about it is amazing. I mean, yeah, we'd love to hear it because it's just so much imagination. I mean, it's our childhood. It's our childhood. This and and you're right. I mean, I remember reading your book about how you know Cocky phone off was yeah. offering to to fly through, and and it was the idea. But no, you need people there, and there's no like <laughs> CGI tricks. This is happening. And it's it brings you so much more into the action because it's so realistic. Yeah. Please just tell us about that experience of driving it through. Well, I mean, the, the one thing that we worked out very quickly was the speed that Corky's plane would be flying and the length of the hangar. It would be in and out in less than a second. Well, that's not very exciting screen time. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with this wild idea that we'd get an old Jaguar car, cut the roof off, weld a pole arm into the chassis in the middle, put a gimbal on the top of it with a full-size BD jet on it that could bank and move, and then paint the car and the pole camouflage colours 
and I'd drive it through the hangar at 75 miles an hour, which gave us much longer screen time. You've got actors and stuntmen running backwards and forwards, um, carefully positioned cameras so you didn't see the me in the Jaguar. Um, and, and I drove through it, I say 75 miles an hour. I did it about five or six times. Um, and the stuntmen would be closing the doors at the far end up to a predetermined mm. spot. Yeah. So that as the plane banked, it just squeezed through the gap. Oh. Well, the gap, I think, gave me about four inches either side of the Jaguar. At uh, that speed, it was um, it was an interesting ride. Um, <laughs> the, the last take, in fact, the I got out through the the doors at the far end, and the throttle had jammed open on the car, and um, it took me a second to realise why I couldn't slow the wretched thing down, and. Um, I ended up, of course, turning off the ignition. That, in turn, turned off the power steering. Um, there's one of Her Majesty's planes parked on the far side of the grass, and I took to the grass heading towards it. Um, ended up spinning the car to try and slow it down. But, you know, they're all sort of fun things and moments that you get... <laughs> doing a bond and you know it, it's it's every schoolboy's dream to get to play with the toys that yeah. um we got to play with yeah i was i was going to say do you file that under what the hell am i doing or this is one of the best jobs in the world <laughs> you know? well, somewhere in between it's, it's the best job in the world afterwards when you're in the bar <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and obviously the you know cars and planes and so it was not the only thing, only car tricks you were doing in Octopussy. You were putting cars on train tracks as well, weren't you? Well, we had a car on the train track which I could <laughs> show Roger how to drive. Not that there was much involved in driving, but um, <laughs> I, I found the first time you did it and you're coming up to a set of points, you you desperately wanted to turn the steering wheel. <laughs> And, of course, that's the last thing you needed to do. Um, but Roger was great. I mean, he, he sat in it and drove it, and he was quite happy with it. We had, had a lot of fun with that. You know, I mean, one of the other uh, wilder moments was on Moonraker when we had to do the bond boat going over the waterfall mm. in Iguazu. And wow. uh, I'd sort of inherited that whole section of the film, got out to Iguazu, and the, the water flowing over the falls was pretty awesome. It was because it was winter, mm. it had rained a lot more. Um, the, the water was very high and we ended up having to walk the boat out. I mean, a couple of tons of bottom speed boat pushed by hand uh, across half a mile of river, um, literally 100 yards up from the edge of the falls, which were 300 foot drop. And the water at times could vary anything between waist deep and over the top of your head and it was flowing very fast I'd, I'd warn the production beforehand that although we were happy to give it a go I was concerned that the boat would get jammed on rocks where they wanted it to go over but uh, you know if they wanted me to go ahead we'd do it so we did two of us spent two days getting the boat out into the middle in position 
and we'd literally wade and swim from rock to rock, rope together. And then I'd get onto a rock, fasten myself off, and Johnny, my assistant, would pay the the rope and the boat out to me. I'd pull the boat across. And then he'd come across, and then we'd go to the next rock. And we got it into position to release and released it. And the boat went right up to the edge of the falls and jammed on a rock. I mean, right, oh, no. right on the edge. It was, well, half the boat was hanging over the edge. Uh, and the water was, I say, flowing extremely fast. The second unit director, Ernie Day, said to me when we got back, well, we can't leave the boat there because we've got to shoot all the plates, background plates. Um, how, how are you going to move it for me? And I said, well, the only thing I can think of is if we go out with a helicopter, I've got a harness, lower me down on the winch and I'll try and push it over. Oh. Um, so we tried that and they kept dropping me in the water and in the bushes and Eventually, I, I got on the rock that the boat was stuck on, um, and I couldn't move. It was far too heavy, and because it had, the rock had pierced the bottom of the boat, the boat was half full of water as well. Mm. We went back to the airfield, and I said to the pilot, look, can you fly me out? Drop me down so I can get hold of the bars on the prow of the boat, and then you fly back over the edge of the falls with me acting as a link, I'll drag the boat until it's over the edge and then let go as it goes. Seemed like a good plan at the time. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, we we uh, the pilot then said, oh, well, I can't do that because the cargo lifting point will only hold 300 kilos. Uh, not the cargo lifting point, sorry, the winch. Okay. So we then came up with the plan that I'd tie a rope to the cargo lifting point under the helicopter, put that on my harness, fly out there. They'd lower me down on the winch until I was hanging on the rope side. And then I, and we'd try it and anyway. We, we got out there and I got eventually got hold of the front of the boat and the helicopter's really straining trying to pull mm -hmm. us over and strangely all i could hear over the rotor noise was a, a very funny ping 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 sound um which took me a few minutes to realize what it was it was the stitching on my harness breaking oh my word um, with the tension so i had to make a very quick decision do i hang on till it's all broken and stay with the boat or do i let go and hope that there's enough yeah. stitches left to keep me under the helicopter. So I opted for the latter, and um, the rest is history. I'm still here. You know. <laughs> so they got the idea I... for uh, the opening of License to Kill. <laughs> yeah. It, um, yeah. Your very own Bond moment. It's, it's the sort of things happen, and, you know, we do it all effects guys and you know we don't get extras like the stunt guys do we yeah. just do it because we got to do it but uh, <laughs> it's it's you know moments like that sort of uh, give you something to talk about in life. <laughs> oh, i mean it's un it's unbelievable john i mean you mentioned moonraker i know you were you were involved in the original casino royale but moonraker was your was your first um, foray into uh, Eon Productions. Yeah. Was that because of your link with Lewis Gilbert that that came about? Well, I knew Lewis very well. I also knew Bill Cartledge, who was the first AD. Yeah. Uh, and I've worked with Bill on quite a few pictures. And um, at the time on Moonraker, um, things weren't happening quite the way they wanted them to. Um, Derek, who was uh, in charge of the picture, was concentrating on the model work back at Pinewood. Um, and there were concerns about the, the physical effects side of the film. Um, so I think Bill and Lewis together 
suggested that they get me in to sort of take over. Hmm. Some are all of it. I I didn't want to tread on anybody's toes because I knew all the guys who were doing it. Yeah. They'd all worked for me in the past. So um, I tried to be diplomatic and say, look, I'll take over all the American side of the filming, which is, um, you know, out in South America and Iguazu and up in Miami. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not silly. I choose the bit where the sunshine is. So. You didn't want to go out to space now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But it, it it was good, and you know the boat chase was particularly again because we did it all for real, real explosions in the water, real speed boats, you know, radio controlled torpedoes. Um, wow! It was, uh, I say, you know, it's a schoolboy's dream, Mark. Definitely amazing. <laughs> flitting from one thing to another but as I look through your book one of the things that really strikes me is some of the gadgets that you were involved in creating and stuff especially on Octopussy the pen now take a fountain pen twist the top and a highly concentrated mixture of nitric and hydrochloric acid dissolves all metals wonderful for poison pen letters pay attention 007 the rope and I just love you to tell us a bit yeah, I'd love you to tell us about some of the process of some of the gadgets that you've created. Well, and stuff. you know, the Indian rope trick, we had to figure out how to make a rope go up in the air with somebody on it. And, yeah. you know, that that's what I was talking about a few moments ago. We had to use very fine piano wires because of the scene where the rope's supposed to break at the bottom yeah. and fall with the the guy on it. You know, the, the first part we could do with pneumatic rams and ropes going up and down through the floor. But to do the breaking one, we had to have a a, a rope with a, a steel bar through the middle of it, a hinge at the point where it had to break. Um, but to support it when it was going up with a man on it, we had to hang it on piano wire. And I was testing it on the stage to check it out um, and got 10 feet up in the air and the wire broke, dumped me on my backside, spraining my ankle. Oh, um, dear. It's one of, the, uh, one of the joys of trying things yourself. I mean, <laughs> all we did was up the size of the piano wire and I, I'm happy to say that the a uh, guy playing the part of the Indian on the on the rope was a lot lighter than me as well, which helped a lot. Thank you. 
How are you? Most unhappy, 007, thanks to you. How can I be expected to maintain the quality of my work? Sent out here at a moment's notice? No proper facilities? Yes, well, you wouldn't have a smaller piece of thread than that, would you? Curious, somebody seems to have stuck a knife in my wallet. Oh, they missed you. What a pity. Karen, see to that, will you? I have uh, also mislaid my PPK. Anything else? No, oh, that's OK. Having problems keeping it up, Q? Experimental model. Obviously, like as well, you you know, you were um, massively involved in creating the Zorin airships for a view to a kill. And there's some amazing pictures in your book about actually filming that Golden Gate Bridge scene. And and both Chris and myself and the rest of us at Really Double Seven, we adore a view to a kill and think that the climax of that, all the way from Mayday's explosion all the way through to the uh, Golden Gate Bridge is just some of the greatest bits of cinema from the 80s uh, we've seen. And you are so responsible for so much of it. And we'd just love you to tell you about tell us about the process, if that's possible. The great thing about the Bonds also was collaboration. Mm -hmm. John Glenn was was a great director to work with. Yeah. Um, we knew one another very well. Um, you know, the, the bonds of of crews are famous, they always a family. Yeah. Um, and you know, that came from Cubby originally. But you know, we, we all knew one another and um we collaborated really well. There was never allowed to be one prima donna. Yeah. department head yeah. mm -hmm. thought their part was more important than everybody else's wow. um, and again I think that's one of the reasons all those bonds showed up so well is because you know a, a good film isn't great effects or great lighting or great mm -hmm. sound it's great everything coming together yeah. you know when, when you get a whole team's work allowed to to join up and shine that's what makes things into a good movie mm -hmm. yeah and working with john you know he'd sit down with a storyboard artist and do a first set of storyboards we'd look through them and you know you, you come to some shots and you look at them and they say well can you do that i say yeah you know i can do it but, you know, that one shot there is going to cost you a million dollars. <laughs> John used to say, well, look, you go and work with a storyboard artist, get him to do it the way you think, bring him back to me and we'll talk about it. And that collaborative ability, and it, you know, it wasn't just with me, it was all the others as well, but it allows you to figure out how you can, with cuts and models and foreground miniatures and uh, everything, put a scene together. Mm. So, you know, we had, um, I think, one, two, three, three or four sizes of Zorin airship, apart yeah. from the full-size one. We had a 10-scale one that floated across the the top of the Golden Gate Bridge with San Francisco in the background. And that was a photographic cutout of San Francisco on the back lot of Pinewood with the real sky behind, with a model bridge in front of it, with a small balloon hanging from a crane over the top. Mm -hmm. um, then we had a 20-foot airship that we could blow up with air all with helium, um, all with hydrogen to blow it up. The beauty of that was if we got shots looking over the top of the, the airship, we could fill it with helium and suspend it from the ground so you didn't have any wires mm. over the top. If you got shots underneath it, we could fill it with air and hang it from a crane with the wires on the top. So... 
you've mm. got the ability to safely hang it and control it, but at the same time, you you were never that worried about losing the the wires or or painting them out. And it was you know lots of tricks like that, and we you know we got away with things. I can remember that there was one shot where they're looking up as the balloon goes over the top in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, we, I shot that with a uh, real crowd of people uh, and our model flying up high over the top of them. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you put it together on the, with the right lens and the right scope, the right film speed, and you can make it look real, but <clears throat> it, it's all a balance. This will hurt him more than me. You know, again on View to a Kill, there was the cavern scene where it, where it floods. Um, yeah. Um, you know, we built a huge model of that because we couldn't quickly flood the, the real set, which filled the 007 stage. So we had a quite a big model, going third or quarter full size. And I wanted to put real people in the model. So into a little section of the model, uh, I cut a, a mirror to fit, and then we stood the actors behind the camera on a rostrum reflected in the mirror. So you could look into, film the model, and there standing in the middle of it were real actors moving. Just having the the toys and the ability to play with things like that and and get it right. I mean, you you know you can't play for too long. You've got to be pretty sure of what you're doing um, because you know the the purse isn't that deep. But um, it, it was great fun doing it. What kind of you, you, like what you're mentioning here is like what kind of attributes do, does a, a great kind of special effects guy need? Like you got collaboration, you've got you know being creative, being practical minded, being able to adapt. You know, is that is that you know when you're looking working with other other pe other people on the, on the films, is that something that you're kind of looking for? And like obviously John Glenn was was an editor, so he, I always feel it sounds like he has an editor's mind. Yeah. For a lay person, you know, when you hear about, you know, special effects, visual effects, people who work on films, it's like, oh, well, they just, it's very much a, a practical thing. It's like, oh, well, they just build things. It's just, it's just to do with, you know, a craft. But what your descriptions of what, what it's like to be on set, there's so much more creativity, you know, problem yeah. solving, you know, like shooting things at different angles. And like, like say, obviously, ad like say, constantly adapting. Is that kind of what you look for in other team, you know, people you work with? I looked for people to do all the things I can't. <laughs> um, great. The great answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate in that, in that I've had great crews working for me. So mm. I've, I've had really good model makers. You know, I mean, my drawing ability sucks, but, um, you know, I, I've had people that can, can draw, I, mm. I, people that can weld, you know, I, I can do a little bit. I'm, I'm a jack of all trades, mm. a master of one, I suppose, which is practical effects. But you know the 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 scope 
that affects cover when you you think about it um and this is why i think working with much smaller crews back in the 60s and 70s um was far more challenging because you know i'd, I'd do films like the devils or the, the straw dogs with pecking bar yeah. with a crew mm. of two of us or three of us right you know, you, you learn to be creative. Mm. Um, you learn to think on your feet. The one thing I, I always felt was always have a plan B. Um, if you're doing a, a, a difficult mm. effect or something that's really tricky that might go wrong, be able to say in, to the director in front of the crew, oh, it's all right, don't worry. We'll do this instead, and it yeah. will still, uh, yeah. you know, plan Bs have got me out of trouble <laughs> on several occasions <laughs> over the years. The scope of what we do, it covers electronics. Nowadays, it covers, you know, computing, mm. computer controls heavily, um, welding, machining, heavy engineering, light engineering, model making, explosives, how to deal with fire how to deal with water um pumping flotation working underwater mm. um you know I've, I've spent quite a number of hours in my life underwater i, I did uh on raise the titanic i think i mm. logged 430 hours submerged yeah um wow uh just on that film um and you know the the silly thing is that you know back in those days you'd, you'd spend all this time underwater i mean i used to some days spend six hours actually underwater mm. you still had time to play practical jokes <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you you just got on with it you we yeah. used to go down and take full bottles with us and rather than go up to the surface to put a fresh bottle on we used to change tanks on the bottom when one mm. ran out yeah. you had to in those days and i think that that gave me and and, and the crews that worked for me um great grounding mm. um and and I say, you know, the ability to, to think on your feet and yeah. um, come up with uh, ideas and plans. You know, I'm, I'm not saying everybody's suited to it. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I think I was very fortunate to work with the the people I work with. Yeah. And, mm. You know, to work with Peckin Park, Billy Wilder, Ken Russell, yeah, wow. Dickie Attenborough, um, John Glenn, and and the wonderful um, Richard Donner, yeah. um, who I did, you know, three films with. You know, it, it's been a privileged existence. Yeah, um, and you know, here I am at the delicate age of seventy six, still doing night work. Can you believe? Yeah. It? <laughs> Can I, can I quickly ask, you know, obviously it's, it's, it might be a bit sort of difficult for you to sort of detach yourself from the films that you've worked on, but of the Bond series, you mentioned that Octopus, you're very proud of the work you did in that, but ac across the series as a whole, is there is there a particular Bond film that you love as a as a cinema lover, you know, as a film yeah. you know, goer, is there something There's that you... a particular you... one I hate. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> go, please yeah. tell us that too. Yes, please tell us. <laughs> another day. Right, okay. Oh, right, right. okay. We're currently reviewing that at the moment, so any insight would be uh, very interesting. Well, an invisible car. <laughs> Bond surfing. <laughs> well, yeah, the surfing, yeah, these are all the common, um, yeah. That whole complaint. plane sequence, which had to be the way it was written, CGI. Mm. It, it, it was just the story. I don't think it gave any of us any chance. To, yeah. to do uh, what is a normal yeah. bond. And I think, you know, they, it was 
led to a degree by visual effects saying they could do things that they couldn't. Mm. Um, yep. I know it was just the wrong combination, but for me, it was it's it's the only bond I've ever worked on that I've not been particularly mm. proud of the effects work that I was responsible for. It was it must be very frustrating. Um, to see, yeah. you know, um, like you say, the, the, there's the, there's so much, and I think that's the, that's the, that I think um, I think it's fair to say that you know the Bond films. Uh, if you get beyond, you know, the, the, how its cultural kind of impact and the fact, you know, it's Bond and it traveling the world and all those kind of things, what appeals to so many people is how practical it is, you know, in terms of if it always feels very, very, very grounded, you know, the stunts, obviously, it, actually doing it for real is often part of the marketing. Well, it certainly used to be. And then the same with like model making. You know, and I, I do feel it's it's, and I know that some of the the, the last films have you know, still continue to use obviously miniatures and models, but I think yeah. it's fair to say that 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 for a long period of time the Bond films were almost sold as as being you know these films the, the, the height of the craft, like you say, yeah. regardless Absolutely. of what department it was, it was the height of of, of, yeah, of that. And, and yet, strangely, if you look back at the history of Bonds, there have been very few. Academy Award nominations. Yeah, shocking. Um, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, uh, yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> no, okay. uh, uh, you know, it's rather silly when you think about it. Mm. And you know, it's, one of yeah. the other bonds that I I did really enjoy, again, partly because of the director Michael Apted, um, mm. who was a lovely man. Oh, was Twine. Yeah, great. Um, you know the the things that we did on that with the you know submarine shooting out in the Bahamas. You know everybody thinks, oh, off to the Bahamas. You know on the jolly. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it it was lovely. We had a nice hotel, had its own golf course. If you ever got the time to play on it, mm -hmm. but you know we were going out to sea every day. We had sea lice to contend with. We had fish that latched themselves onto the model, thinking the model was a bigger fish. Um, so we were forever chasing them off. Shark swimming by while we were doing it. You know, we were 120 feet down and we were, what were we, about 100 feet away from the Atlantic drop-off um, where it just went down... Uh. 3,000 feet. Oh, um, my word. We were, I'd got this big boat that we were using as a mothership. And we had the ability to lift the model in and out of the water. I mean, the model weighed several tons and it was 60 odd feet long. Yeah. Um, it had its own flotation in it and motors and air things and whatever. Um, but we still had to control it and keep it on wires for safety. Um, and whenever we broke for lunch, I'd make sure or ask the divers to put the safety tethers on it and pull it in, hang it under the mothership. One day we broke for lunch and we were up on the deck and I said to the divers, you did put the safeties on the model didn't you when we came up and they all sort of went pale and looked at one another oh no it's over the side and there was the model bouncing along the bottom oh, um, oh, no. going towards the drop off oh no if it had gone over the edge I mean we'd have lost I, I, I hate to pick what would have happened yeah oh. um, and you've never seen five guys put air tanks on so quickly. I mean, I, I, I was the first one down there. And I managed to get hold of the front of the sub and dig my eels in the sand um, while the rest of them got ropes and cables yeah. over and we pulled it back and made it safe. But, you know, the scary little moments like that do make life more interesting sometimes. How was the um, the boat chase in Twine? Because we, we love Twine. It's great. 
one, but the, the miniature boat and then the actual sorting the sequence out, it, the product's incredible. How was it for you guys in special effects? Well, that, that was all done um, for real. The only model that was involved in that was I had a very small model that we fired out of the um, MI6 mm. building. Stop! Stop! You didn't finish! Stop! That started the sequence off. After that, it was all um, real boats uh, racing up and down. Millennium Dome. Oh, yeah. yeah. That blowing up. that we we did a lot of model boat stuff on tomorrow never dies as well mm. oh the um the dark boat and the uh stealth boat um and the frigate which sank uh and we shot that all in the titanic tank in rosarito yeah. oh wow again you know sort of challenging underwater stuff but quite fun to do one missile at the mix The last broadcast, sir. Mr. Gupta's little trick with the encoder worked. They gave the final position 70 miles from here. British Navy will never find them. Survivors in the water. Mr. Stamper, I'm having fun with my headlines. I need to know the exact number of survivors. I'm late for a meeting. Make sure you use the right kind of ammunition. Yes, sir. Delicious. I mean, just listening to you, I'm not just saying this, you're like a real-life James Bond, John. <laughs> you know, you, you, if you're not underwater, you're driving cars at 75 miles an hour with aeroplanes on top of them. It's it's absolutely incredible. Well, I'd say it's a sort of a bit of a privileged life, really, of... <laughs> I can't say I've had fun along the way. What would you say, I mean, all across the body, beyond Bond, what film are you most proud, proud, I suppose, proud of your work on? Ask that question every single time I'm interviewed. And okay. there, there is never a straight answer to it. I'm proud of so many films mm. for so many different reasons. 
Yeah. Some of them were just fun to work on. Some of them were, shall we say, a little more challenging because of the director involved. <laughs> um, you know, I, I did three films on the trot many years ago uh, when I was quite young in my 20s. One was The Devils with Ken Russell, uh -huh. um, who could be a, uh, inclined to shout and scream and lose his temper a bit. Um, <laughs> I, I loved him, really. and uh, I, I always found the, the best way with directors like that is to shout back. <laughs> um, you either stay on the film or you don't, but either way you don't get shouted at. Um, but Ken was lovely. Peckinpah was a very interesting director to work with. <laughs> Um, hard man mm -hmm. um, enjoyed his alcohol and stuff could be difficult mm -hmm. uh, I showed him a load of tests at the beginning of the movie and he said um, Jesus Christ kid where were you I, I needed you on the wild bunch you know I, I did a movie called Lucky Lady with Stanley Dodden mm -hmm. um, I did several films with Stanley lovely man and you know he directed Singing in the Rain and so many great movies and you know working at sea on boats for six months in the gulf of mexico blowing boats up left right and center with gene hackman burt reynolds and liza minnelli oh. i was 27 28 and a lot of the crew and all the stuntmen were from hollywood mm. um and, it, you know, it was Jesus, who is this limey kid. It, it was a it was a challenging movie. And I always loved it for that reason. Mm. Um, yeah. The Bonds were challenging. The Potter films, you know, I did all eight of those. But they weren't as much fun mm. to do. The first four Harry Potters for me are still the best. And it was... I don't think anybody ever gave Chris Columbus, the director, mm. the kudos because he set the whole thing up mm. for all the directors that followed, the casting, the look, the everything. And they were really special. But, you know, as, as a series of eight movies, they're classics. So, mm. you know, I'm, I'm quite pleased and proud to have been part of those. Absolutely. Um, I did a you know a bunch of films. I worked in Hollywood for, well, lived out there for fourteen years, and you know some of those were hard going. Working with Paul Verhoeven on Starship Troopers was mm -hmm. um, challenging to say the least, but you know managed to get through them all. So mm. absolutely, um, you know, there's uh, th there's a lot of movies, The Omen. Again, you know, working with Richard Donner yeah. and chopping people's heads off and <laughs> grease and things. came up with the ideas we did everything on the movie and i think the whole special effects budget including salaries was something like twenty two thousand pounds on the omen you know yeah. um, wow. so different films for different reasons is the answer amazing yeah. and obviously you know you're an oscar winning six, six nominations only one win but it was unfortunate for when cliffhanger was up we were up against the first jurassic park oh, yeah. and when yeah <laughs> troopers were up we were up against titanic yeah Did yeah deserve it over us 
tell you what, o- Octopussy deserved it in 1983, that's for sure. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but there you go. Oh, thank you so much yes. for your time john uh it's really kind we recognize that you're an incredibly busy man and um it really means a lot to us that you know we can hear some of the stories of just a snippet of your career brilliant thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. It's, yeah yeah thank <laughs> you for sharing some of these amazing stories with us Thank you, John. Thanks so much for your time. Lovely to meet you. You can hear loads of our other episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and our YouTube channel, where we have interviews, special episodes, and reviews of all the Bond films. Simply search Really 007 Pod, and you should find loads of weird and wonderful content. Remember, you're only president for life. (laughs)